Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. This is the Fast Friday edition of the show for December 27th, 2019. On this episode, I'm going to share with you the latest news from the nullification movement. There's a lot of legislation being filed in states around the country for the 2020 legislative session covering all kinds of issues. And on this episode, we're going to talk mass surveillance, so bills to take on things like stingray spying, facial recognition, and even smart meters or advanced meters that they install at your home. We've got bills to report on on asset forfeiture prohibition, and even a really interesting bill that specifically takes on a potential federal red flag law. I'll be doing all that and maybe a little bit more depending on time. But first of all, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. You can find all of our channels. We've got video that we do live, plus we have archive video version and archived audio-only podcast editions. Find all of those platforms, all of our social media channels, ways you can register, follow, support us, our membership program, uh, links for the show notes, things that I reference in each episode, and you'll definitely want that for this one specifically. All of that is over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Again, that's all spelled out, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. I'm really grateful for you spending some time with me today. I hope you had a wonderful Christmas. I hope, hope you have some nice plans for the New Year's holiday coming up in the next few days. But I promise to not take up too much of your time today since it's Fast Friday. Let's see if I can get this done in 10 to 15 minutes. Who knows? A, a quick note here. Basically, all the legislation that I'm covering, even if it isn't in your state, there's something that you can do. You're going to, first of all, go to the show notes page at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Look for the link for the bill that you find interesting and then get the link to the legislation. It's in all of our reports. I'll have all the reports listed that I'm going to talk about and send that bill from whatever state it is over to your own state rep and state senator and say, you know what? This has been filed in this other state. I'd like you to take a look at doing this in, in, in our state here. And if you live in a state where you see a piece of legislation that you support, you definitely want to call your state senator and state representative and ask them to co-sponsor and or support that particular bill number. A simple phone call will take a few minutes. You'll probably talk to a voicemail message or some assistant. They'll register your information. I mean, they'll log down your support pro or con on the bill. I would always ask for them to contact you back so you could give them your contact information. Most of the time they won't, or they'll send you some boilerplate stuff either by mail or by phone, however you provide them, or by email, however you provide them information. But put a little bit of pressure on. A lot of these people don't hear hear from anybody about state level legislation. So we've heard many times that as little as 10 or 15 people calling a committee member, for example, on a specific bill can encourage them to actually vote to move the bill forward if they're sitting on the fence. Anyways, with that kind of strategic plan of attack, first of all listed, let's get into the legislation. First, we're going to talk about mass surveillance and a number of bills. It looks like I've got one, two, five bills that I want to talk about today. First of all, in South Carolina, House Bill 4817, it's a coalition of both uh, Republican and Democratic state representatives in South Carolina filed the South Carolina Data Privacy Act. According to this report by Mike Meharry, the legislation would ban South Carolina to Carolina, South Dakota, South Carolina law enforcement agencies from obtaining the location information, stored data, or transmitted data of an electronic device, or the electronic information or data transmitted by the owner to a remote computing service provider, that is, putting it into the cloud, without a warrant based on probable cause. Now, passage of this would specifically help block the use of cell site simulators. We often call them Stingray devices. That's the brand name for a cell site simulator product produced by the Harris Corporation. Basically, what these devices do, they're small, they're mobile, they can be carried around, they could be mounted on a drone. What they do is they spoof a cell phone tower and they get very granular, very detailed information from all cell phones that are within range of that tower, pinging them and encouraging them to connect to the device, which they actually do 
before the information is seamlessly passed along to the cell tower. So the end user doesn't even know they're being tracked and traced and monitored and all their information basically downloaded into the government agent's Stingray device or cell site simulator. So passage of H4817 in South Carolina would be a very big first step forward for that state. A similar bill was filed last year and has officially been carried over to the 2020 session in Hawaii. This is from Senator Russell Rutterman, along with three co-sponsors. It's Senate Bill 465, and it's almost the same process. They do list three exceptions. They're definitely giving them wiggle room with this, but I would rather force them to work through the wiggle room as long as we are very clear that this is only a first step. I think it can be very positive. So the legislation, actually, or the report here from Meharry gives the three examples where they can actually get, use the Stingray device. For example, uh, they have, first of all, they have to have a warrant based on probable cause. And then there's three situations where they wouldn't have to if the person gives informed consent or in accordance with a legally recognized exception to the warrant requirement. That's a problem with the court system, and everyone seems to want to, want to follow that. I'm not on board with that, but I recognize sometimes we have to get a foot in the door. And then three, an emergency involving the danger or death of death or serious bodily injury. Of course, we know that they'll try to expand that. So hopefully people in Hawaii will uh, contact their state senators and work to get Senate Bill 465 tightened up, but it would be a good first step forward there in Hawaii should it pass. Now, in New Hampshire, there's a bill, House Bill 1642, that would totally ban the government use of facial recognition. Here's 1642. It's eight representatives, bipartisan coalition. They filed this bill. It says, quote, neither the state nor any state official shall obtain, retain, access or use any face surveillance system or any information obtained from a face surveillance system. In practice, they would be totally banned from using them in the state, but in practice, they would also be totally banned from using any data collected by other agencies in other states, any law enforcement agency here in Los Angeles, that they uh, take the information from a facial recognition system, then they upload it to a fusion center, and then it's passed around and made accessible to all law enforcement agencies or most all of them around the country. They wouldn't be able to access that. They wouldn't be able to access or use facial recognition information from the TSA, Department of Homeland Security, the FBI's next gen database, any of these. So this, I think, is one of the best facial recognition stoppage bills because it really just is an all-out ban without exceptions. So House Bill 1642 in New Hampshire. I also wanted to point out that last week we published a report on a local effort in Massachusetts. Most of the local efforts to take on facial recognition have come from here in California in the Bay Area, but we're starting to see that spread a little bit further. So a week ago, a week before Thanksgiving, that Thursday, Northampton became the third Massachusetts city to ban facial recognition technology with a unanimous vote by the city council, which is pretty awesome. We're starting to see the votes not even be close on this because there's a lot of popular support across the political spectrum for banning the use of this type of mass warrantless surveillance technology that's going to track and trace people no matter where they are by their face. Now, just a week before Mike Meharry puts in his report, he says, Brookline, Massachusetts passed a similar ban. Somerville, Massachusetts approved an ordinance prohibiting, notice they pass an ordinance. They're not passing resolutions that talk about opposing facial recognition. They're passing ordinances specifically making law to ban the use of this type of technology. That's how they have a real practical effect. So Somerville approved an ordinance as well, prohibiting the technology earlier this year. And the city of Springfield, Mike reports, is considering a ban as well. There are also a number of bills moving through the Massachusetts state legislature to take on facial recognition on the state level. But this is very positive news. And I also mentioned smart meters. I don't know if I'm really going to get into too many details about this, but I wanted to point out this also this other report here that we published just before Christmas, that House Bill 1611 in, in the Missouri House and House Bill 1405 in the New Hampshire House have been filed. They would basically allow utility customers in each of those states, should they pass, to opt out of using a smart meter or having a smart meter installed. They have two-way connections. We consider them a privacy nightmare. I know there are other people out there who talk about health concerns. I don't really know much about that, but I know it is a privacy 
nightmare. It's a potential surveillance tool, and you can just opt out. A lot of states that have actually looked at doing this, they always want to charge you extra to opt out. Like, uh, yeah, of course you can get out of this, but we're going to charge you an extra maybe 20 bucks a, 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 a bill or something that's relatively significant, especially for people who don't have much money in the first place or a $60 fee. But both of these bills, I believe in both Missouri and New Hampshire, would allow people to opt out of having one of these surveillance devices attached to their home without being charged a penalty for wanting to keep private. On asset forfeiture, there's another bill in Missouri, House Bill 1776, a pretty awesome bill number, would prohibit Missouri law enforcement agencies or prosecutors from entering into agreements to transfer seized property to a federal agency by way of adoption. That's something that's under the Federal Equitable Sharing Asset Forfeiture Program. It's government sanctioned stealing or for other means, according to the report, for the purpose of the property's forfeiture under federal law. Now, it's important to point out that Missouri actually has some of the best state level restrictions on asset forfeiture. But we had that here in California a number of years as well. And then somehow some people were digging into this and finding out that the law enforcement agencies were still doing tons, millions and millions of dollars worth of property seized under these asset forfeiture programs. And the question is then asked, well, how are they doing this if they're banned? Are they just ignoring it? Well, in a way, yes. In a way, no. They're banned under state law, but there is a really tricky thing that the federal government pushes called equitable sharing. And all they have to do in a local law enforcement agency is call up a federal agent in the FBI or a DHS or the ATF or the DEA or any of these uh, problematic federal agencies. I'm just being kind, I guess. They call them and they say, you know, uh, we think this is looks like a federal case here. We've seized some property, but we can't keep it here. Do you think this is a federal case? And most of the time when if they decide to say yes, virtually all the time, I would think they're saying yes. Yeah, we'll take that on. What happens is the local law enforcement basically becomes federal agents. They're basically working as federal agents. They're partnering in some kind of a partnership program, a task force with the federal agents. They continue to work the case. The federal government is really seizing the property under civil asset forfeiture. And then they divvy some back. They sell it off or whatever. If it's cash, maybe they just divvy it out. However, they work that out. But basically, the federal government keeps about 20 percent and then they send 80 percent back to the state or local law enforcement agencies. And so this is really an end run around restrictions. The federal government pushes aggressively an end run around restrictions on, on state level civil asset forfeiture. So it's essential to do what California did and a number of other states have done, which is to opt out of the federal asset forfeiture program. California has opted out of about 80 to 85%. It looks like from Mike's report on this, that House Bill 1776 would basically ban them from doing an end run around state law. I have to look at it a little bit closer. It was filed by Representative Tony Lavasco from O'Fallon, Missouri. So keep an eye on that. It looks very positive to me, and we'll be following it as well. And then on asset forfeiture, this is... This isn't an awesome piece of legislation, but I think it's interesting, especially considering where it's coming from. In New Jersey, Senate Bill 1963 actually passed both legislatures. It doesn't do anything to stop asset forfeiture, but it creates a system where they actually have to be transparent about where the forfeitures are coming from. So over the next couple of years, we're going to see in New Jersey, it's going to be very public. They have to publish these reports saying how much they've gotten from both the state and the federal asset forfeiture programs. Most of these states, when they participate in these, they try to shroud it in secrecy. And this type of legislation, in a, especially in a place like New Jersey, where it's almost impossible to get something to pass that's positive, this is a foot in the door. Small things grow great by concord. If we're thinking of the advice from John Dickinson, the penman of the revolution, and it allows the people in New Jersey who want to stop asset forfeiture to at least publicize what's going on. And then once you can do that, maybe they can take another step forward. So Senate Bill 1963 should be on the governor's desk. Let me see if I can see where it is. It passed both houses 77 to zero. It passed on December 16th out of the assembly. It's a pretty easy vote. And it looks like the Senate passed it by a vote of 37 to zero. So no one voted against this in either chamber. So that's really, really good news. Hopefully it gets signed by the governor there. 
And then uh, in New Hampshire, I mentioned we've got a lot of New Hampshire and Missouri stuff these days. House Bill 1201, it's a bipartisan coalition of representatives and senators. They would allow adults over 21 to possess up to one and a half ounces of cannabis or 10 grams of hashish, along with certain marijuana infused products. It would also allow the cultivation, Mike reports in his, uh, uh, looks like this was published on December 17th, it would allow cultivation of up to six marijuana plants at a person's place of residence. What I find really interesting about this is most legislation to legalize marijuana or decriminalize it really creates a state level bureaucracy. And this piece of legislation, I think is there's other bills in New Hampshire. What I like about this one is it's mostly a decriminalization. They aren't setting up a regulatory scheme for commercial or retail sales, although at some point businesses are gonna have to be able to get involved, but this primarily just establishes that people aren't going to go to jail and they can home grow. I think it's a really interesting approach in a state that has really resisted moving forward on this, even though all their neighbors have taken steps forward despite the federal prohibition. And then the last piece of legislation that I want to cover today is in Kansas. It's companion bills, House Bill 2425 and Senate Bill 245. This is from TJ Martinell, who is awesome on uh, reporting on our lot of, a lot of our legislation to protect the right to keep and bear arms. He says this one's titled the Kansas Anti-Red Flag Act. The legislation declares that federal red flag laws would infringe upon the constitutional rights of Kansas residents. I'm not going to get into the problem with that statement, but that's what it says in the bill, including but not limited to the right to due process, the right to keep and bear arms and the right to free speech. The anti-red flag act. And TJ points out in this article that just that declaration is going to do nothing. That's basically like passing a non-binding resolution. We've got an opinion that this would violate these particular rights, but it includes some very specific legalese that would prohibit anyone from participating in red flag laws. So this is how TJ put it. He said it would also make it a felony offense, a felony offense. This is no joke for any individual, including a law enforcement officer to enforce a federal red flag law. And I think this should be pretty clear. In effect, this would bar state and local police from enforcing a federal red flag law. We know there's a lot of people that want to implement that on a national level. I hope you guys found this really interesting. I hope you found it educational. I hope uh, whatever bill you find interesting or you find important for your area, or if you've got multiple ones, I'll make sure to have all the links to all these reports in the show notes. And just to pull it back up on video, for example, if we're talking about this anti-red flag act in any report that we have, you'll see something like here, representative Michael Hauser filed house bill 2425. And you'll see in parentheses, HB 2425, all the red text on our website, those are clickable links. So just click or tap it and you'll be able to see that piece of legislation. Then you can take the link to that legislation and email it over to your state rep and state senator. I always encourage a phone call as well or a follow-up. So you could email it and then do a phone call follow-up if you get some kind of stupid template response or you get ignored. But phone calls really have a lot of impact. But that's how you actually go about finding the legislation on our website. Again, I'll have the links to those over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty sometime anywhere a half hour to an hour after we're done here with this live broadcast. Again, thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with me today. Make sure to smash that like button. If you like the show, subscribe. If you're on iTunes or any other podcast platform, just listening in, uh, make sure to leave a review. The positive reviews have been coming in very consistently, not tons of them, but consistently. And every time I see one, I'm noticing that the download stats are actually going up a little bit. So I think it really does work where the more positive reviews we get, the more the platforms are sending the program to more people. And of course, if you really, really like what we're doing, here's my pitch. 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. You can sign up for as little as two bucks a month and absolutely nothing helps us get the job done more than the financial support of our members. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you have an awesome weekend. I'll see you next week here on the Path to Liberty.